I'm Jerry Francoeur with the Alamo Breast Cancer Foundation, and welcome to this chat on ototoxicity, hearing, balance, and tinnitus. This is an important item that has come up in the last couple of years in the research, so I thought it was really important that we have a chat on this. I want to introduce Dr. Ariel Richard. She is a licensed audiologist through the state of Florida and certified through the American Speech Language Hearing Association. She did her undergraduate and doctorate degree through the University of Southern Mississippi and her residency externship through the Biloxi VA. Um, she learned, she specialized in uh, managing tinnitus and diagnosing balance disorders and is currently employed at the Atlantic Hearing Balance and Tinnitus Center where she works mostly with the adult population for hearing and tinnitus. Yes. And I am so thankful she is here. She actually is my audiologist because this topic is extremely personal to me. So we will get started. Dr. Richards, explain to us what ototoxicity is. Yes, hi, and thank you for having me. I'm, I'm so blessed and honored to get to be a part of this advocate chat. Um, really, one of the biggest things about ototoxicity is it is essentially ear poisoning. Um, it's ear poisoning from exposure to specific types of drugs, which damage our inner ear system and the vestibular cochlear nerve. Um, can you explain to us a little bit how hearing and the brain work together? Yeah, so one of the reasons why ototoxicity is so detrimental um, to brain health is I actually have a lovely diagram. I love this, um, but if you guys can see it, you know, it shows our entire ear system. Um, your ears are the funnel for the brain, okay? Um, so when we're hearing, the sound travels in the ear, it hits that little eardrum, Okay, it moves the little bones and then it travels to our organ of hearing. That's our cochlea. The cochlea is directly attached to the balance organ. Okay, when sound passes through there, it travels up the auditory nerve where it gets processed on either side. Um, if there is an issue along the pathway, your brain doesn't receive the information that's needed to process information. Um, and that and processing is loss is one of the number one reasons which brings people in when they have a hearing issue. So when there's ototoxicity or this cochlear region becomes damaged, um, those little hair cells inside your cochlea, they can't regrow or repair themselves. What's done is done. So it's extremely important to understand um, how ototoxicity works, who is at risk for it, and what can happen if intervention isn't completed. Um, but it's one of those things that if we don't talk about it and we don't acknowledge that it can happen, then we're not going to be prepared to handle and treat the issues when they come up. Can you explain a little bit about the what causes ototoxicity? Primarily in this chat, we're talking about the cancer drugs that we take to, to treat cancer, but all the other things that can also cause ototoxicity as well? Absolutely. So with, especially with cancer treatments, you know, these drugs are amazing to help treat and keep people alive. Um, but there are side effects to everything that we take into our body. There's side effects to things that we even eat in our foods. Um, so one of the things about these certain drugs is a lot of them are used to treat cancer with chemotherapy, radiation, cisplatin, carboplatin, um, those are all relatively ototoxic. And it's not that we want to stop people from taking these drugs, because these are life-saving medications, but we want to understand the full scope of what they have on the remainder of the health and how somebody moving forward from recovery um, can look into their overall health to ensure that they're maintaining that healthy lifestyle. 
When we're diagnosed with cancer, um, we are told to go see a dentist to get any dental work done. Um, a lot of times, uh, cardiac workup. But can you explain why it's also important to get a baseline on your hearing? Absolutely. So, you know, we know these medications are going to have side effects. And so your hearing is one of your five, your senses. And so if we're not getting a baseline to understand where we're at prior to treatment, then how are we going to be ready to intervene when something changes? You know, the purpose of getting a baseline done in any aspect of our health is to monitor and track when changes occur. And so that goes with the hearing, the balance system, um, you know, with your heart. It's if we don't know where we're starting, then how do we know when things changed? When it comes to the hearing, the earlier you intervene, the better outcome that patient has for success in communication. So we know that the longer patients wait to come in to treat their hearing loss, the harder it is for their brain to adapt to sounds and the harder it is for their brain to process speech. I can't tell you how many times I have people coming in um, who have had noticed problems with their hearing for 10, 15 years, but waited until it got bad enough before they started intervention. Um, and unfortunately for those patients who wait so long, they have a more difficult time rehabilitating their brain back to sound. If you lose your hearing tomorrow and you would be banging on the door trying to figure out, you know, what's going on. But when you lose it gradually, it's even more scary because you don't realize what you're missing until you get it back. Um, when it comes to ototoxicity, especially, uh, you typically will lose frequencies or hearing, you would have hearing loss in frequencies of speech that you may not hear every single day. They're called the ultra high frequencies. So generally it starts in those pitches of speech, um, which we don't typically hear, and then it will gradually make its way to the areas that we utilize every day for communication. And that's that can be sneaky because it sneaks up on you. Um, and that's a gradual way, but if we're not testing all of that prior to, then we don't know when we've lost it and we don't know how long that person has gone not receiving that information, which puts like balance and a brain health, you know, at risk. That's interesting you say that because my husband kept telling me that I wasn't listening and that I was going deaf, and I thought it was selective hearing. Um, just I didn't want to <laughs> hear what he had to say. Um, and then I read the article on ototoxicity and the cancer drugs and started doing my research and found you, who is an audiologist. And that was very important because I definitely needed somebody who helped with balance because I had fallen several times and couldn't figure out why I had fallen. Um, I also would be walking and all of a sudden wander to the right and then wander to the left. And you would think I was drunk, but I wasn't. So after a lot of investigation, I found you. And I will say that she is one of very few in Florida. Um, people like Dr. Richard's training are really hard to find throughout the U.S. And I was very lucky to, to find her. Um, but could you talk on some of the um, credentialing? Absolutely. So um, one of the things, you know, when it comes to getting a baseline for an evaluation, when it's for the purpose of, you know, the, the, the hearing system, the balance system, is you don't want to omit any testing. Uh, you want a full workup because we don't know in what aspect that ototoxicity is going to come into play. And so if we're only testing the bare minimum, you know, then that's not fair 
to that person undergoing it. When it comes to testing, a full test battery can mean, you know, tympanometry, which is a pressure test in the ear, reflex testing for those little bones behind the ears. Um, you want to do um, otoacoustic emissions. Um, that's your testing of the hair cell function. Once you go into that, of course, it's going to be the pure tone audiometry. That's the tones that you can hear. Um, the processing uh, system, which is word testing, you want to make sure you're getting done. I, I go as far as um, if we need to, if there's a difference, brain auditory brainstem testing, um, balance testing, I think is so important, especially as well, because I want to know if there's a deficit to the balance system as well as the hearing system. We know they're connected so closely and balance testing um, is even more so tests that don't even pertain to hearing it. It's, it's, it's making sure that that person can follow and track. It's making sure that if we emit dizziness into them, that their, their balance system can recover from those, that testing. And an audiologist would be the person that would be able to do all of that. Uh, unfortunately, with hearing alone, it's not regulated as well as it could be. Um, and because of that, they do have facilities where if you're just looking for hearing to treat hearing with hearing devices, um, you can go and see somebody who is not an audiologist and be fit with hearing devices by someone that's not an audiologist. Um, this may work for people who are coming in strictly solely for the purpose of, I want a hearing device. But if we're not interested in that perspective, especially at the beginning for getting a baseline, is we want to get a full test battery and be monitored by somebody that who's doing all of these tests. Because if something were to change, we're able to repeat the, the test batteries to see, okay, this, it's six months into treatment and they scored this, this, and this on their test. Okay, so we're starting to see that the medication is taking effect on the balance and hearing systems. Now it's time to intervene. And we can easily intervene at the right amount of right time versus if you're going just, you know, for a basic hearing evaluation uh, from anyone that's not doing all of the full test batteries. It's interesting you say that because when I was doing my research and found you, I found out that in the state of Florida that you only need a high school education to open up a hearing aid store. And it's very important that people, when they want to get a baseline test, that they actually do the research and find an audiologist. Because in my case, when I went in to see you, I had lost way more than I thought of. I remember you told me that um, normal hearing is here, deafness is here, and I was like in the middle and had no idea I had lost that much. And he explained to me how with the help of the hearing devices, which are smarter than I am, um, <laughs> I got 96% of my hearing back. But again, as you mentioned before, the longer you wait, the less chance you are of getting your hearing back. So I just want people to understand that when they want to go and get a baseline, especially if they're going to be treated for um, cancer and have any of the uh, platinums as their medication, um, to find an audiologist that is trained in this um, because it, it makes a big difference. Um, that's the other thing I want you to talk about is the risk of falls and cognition with hearing loss. Well, and that's to me on per, to me, I think that's the most important reason why you treat your hearing loss with hearing devices. You know, in your circumstance, you know, with you bringing it up, it's what we're looking at is we're saying, okay, we have found a hearing loss. Um, if we restore the hearing back to normal, put the hearing device in your ears um, at your level or prescriptive need, can you still, what is your 
percentage of your ability to detect speech and understand speech. And that's where like you scored the 96% on that test. When we elevated the words, you were able to do very well. Um, I look at that as there are people who have waited so long that even when we elevate the level to which they need to, to hear the words, their ability to process the speech is not what we want it to be. You know, for some people, they're scoring 60, 70, 40 percent on those tests. And it's a harder conversation to have because, OK, yes, we need to treat the hearing loss uh, by amplification, but we're only going to be at a 60 percent understanding rate. And that can be really hard for somebody to take in who is not aware the importance of treating earlier rather than later, you know, because we think, okay, we put these hearing devices in, oh, I should be hearing perfectly fine. I mean, I think we all know somebody who wears hearing devices and we're just like, I don't understand why they can't understand me. They have the hearing aids in, why, why can't, why, why aren't they working, right? Oh, well, you know, a lot of things go into that, but ultimately it's the processing. What's their processing level when they got the hearing devices? You know, the number one cause of death in patients over 65 is false. So if a person comes in and they have the hearing loss, um, what happens is your balance uses three sensory parts to help you. Um, it's your ears it's your vision and it's your somatosensory sensory or your legs and feet. Uh, when any one of those three spots is at a deficit, then you're going to try to overcompensate with one of the others. What we see happening a lot, um, as especially as people age, is if their hearing goes, they start to rely on their vision and they start looking down at where they're walking instead of standing tall with good posture and looking ahead. They start using, looking down. They also will start shuffling their feet um, because they want to feel the ground below them. Um, and so when you start to shuffle and you're starting to look, now your posture is decreased, you're hunched over. And of course you're gonna be more at risk for tripping over something, tripping over your feet, you know, falling because you're use, you're working so hard to use those two other features that it's just it's bound and that's where the research is bound to happen. If we can restore the hearing and get a person's posture improved, get them looking upright, able to hear things to the left and to the right of them, well then we can help prevent the risk of fall. As we get older also, you know, there's probably there's side effects of all these other things of getting older. But, you know, our somatosensory of sensory is not as good as we get older. Our muscles get weaker. Our vision gets weaker. That can, you know, all these things can happen. So if we're able to restore at least one of those senses, you know, to, to the best of its ability, then you're already going to be setting yourself up for a better position in that perspective. You know, when when you're not processing or your your balance is affect you know your quality of life just decreases as well and that's not what we want you know the whole purpose of especially um for patients who have undergone cancer is the recovery you're doing you're here for a reason you're living your best life you know you made it through you recovered or maybe you're in the recovery process you want to continue living your life so it's how can we make sure that we're doing everything we can to give you your best life? And I think that's really important. Um, I know a lot of times when you fall and you're elderly, um, you tend to be in the bed more frequently. And that also causes the development of pneumonia, which a lot of elderly people die from because they fell, broke a hip, and then they develop pneumonia. and my feeling is the more we can help with the hearing and the balance, which will help prevent the falls, the better your quality of life is and the better um, that you're doing. 
so to me, it, it's having found you was like a lifesaver for me because my balance has increased dramatically. Um, I know I was standing there uh, talking to my daughter and I just fell over backwards for no reason. I just lost my balance. And she looked at me like I was nuts and go, what are you doing? And I'm like, I don't know. Um, but that that could have been scary. Luckily, we were inside and um, I happened to fall on the bed. So I wasn't hurt. But it, it, it was a scary thing that you can be standing there and all of a sudden just fall over. So um, going back, you did the PT, you know, and the hearing. I it's a, it's an amazing story, you know, your story especially. Um, I did. Yeah, th that's the other thing is if you go to PT, you want to get somebody who is certified in vestibular. Um, so the two of you work very well together. Um. Can you speak a little bit about um, management to intervention? Absolutely. So, you know, we, we talked a lot about, you know, hearing and how it affects the brain health and everything like that. Well, the whole purpose of getting the baseline is going to be so that when we see a drop or the decline below normal, that we are ready and able to intervene with, whether that be amplification or balance therapy. Um, because again, not only from the balance aspect of things, but the processing and the cognition, you know, uh, patients with hearing loss that are left untreated are more at risk and it's correlated to the development of memory issues and cognitive decline. Uh, so that's something that is extremely scary but if you think about it you know our, our body is amazing it all works together if you're not feeding your brain the right amount of information it's going to forget how to process that information and so our I, ideally what we'd like to do is when there's a decline we want to intervene at that moment so that we can restore that back to the brain so that the brain isn't going without for long, because again, not only processing, but it can affect memory, cognition, and, and that's something that we, we don't wanna see. And that does affect quality of life, but if we don't have the, the baseline testing, then we don't know at what point to intervene. We only know when that person decides to come in and say, I'm really having trouble hearing. Um, that now I want to get a test. Okay, well, we'll test you. We'll, and if we find a problem, okay, well, we have a problem, but I really don't know when this problem started. I don't know how long you've gone. And that's where I don't know what we can get back. It, it's, it's better earlier than later. So the whole purpose of ototoxicity monitoring is actually, we know it's going to happen. Unfortunately, we know there is a big risk to it. It's we do it so that we know when to intervene and help that person and their family with communication. Um, when do you suggest, I know when you've been diagnosed with cancer, you need to get all your baselines done before you start treatment. However, for those people who are maybe caretakers or whatever, when do you recommend getting baseline started? I remember when I was young and in school, they did it all the time in the school system. But until I met you, I don't think I ever had a hearing test after that. And, you know, that's something that's, you know, a big problem. We hear, we recommend, you know, at the, after the age of 40, get, get one done if you haven't had one. Um, a lot of workforces do hearing tests or they require a hearing test, but it's not for the purpose of treating. It's for the purpose of just checking a box saying they got a hearing test done um, for like work standards of volume level in the workplace. Uh, but one of the things that you with kids especially is we're, you know, when a baby's born, they're getting a hearing exam, you know, within while they're still at the hospital. 
if they don't pass that hearing hearing screening, they're being referred to an audiologist for an even bigger hearing exam. Um, and they're on, and then from there, yeah, we do that in schools. Um, if if something doesn't pass in schools, they're referred out to an, an audiologist. But when it comes to adults, um, that's where I've seen it's it's lacked a little bit. Is you know whether that be due to the deregulation or whether that be to you know your primary care physician not knowing where to send you, you know not not knowing which office is going to be where you need to go. Um, and it's so important, you know, at Atlantic, we do a lot of physician marketing where we're talking to the physicians so that they're aware, because as much as the physicians know that you need, you need it, it's do they know where to send you? Is there a hospital nearby? Is there a clinic nearby? Is there somewhere where you can go? to get that hearing exam. What I'm really happy about is a lot of the primary care physicians are starting to do hearing screenings in um, their appointments, which is unbelievable. Um, and that's something that is awesome because just having that screener done and knowing, okay, they passed or failed. Okay, now we we see them. That's great that they're, ad they're advocating for the hearing as well. Um, but it's one of those things that if, if we're not aware of the importance of getting a hearing test, um, then we're not going to do it, you know? And so that's where the, the advocate, you have to advocate, you know, when you're getting your baselines done, get everything checked out. You know, we want to see everything. You should want to see everything because you don't know what or when or what could cause cause an issue. And so if you're not getting the, all those baselines done, then we don't really know when anything's declining or changing. So basically around 40, where we, the majority of people suggest you start doing mammograms. When you get your mammograms, get your hearing done too. Yeah. Just like, like you say, just like vision, you know, vision, we go to the dentist, you know, it's, 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 it should be part of a whole health model. It's one of your senses. So the, the more you can get done as a diagnostic to see where everything's at. I love when I get patients who come in that have normal hearing because I'm like, you know what? And and they 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 look at it, you know, sometimes they're like, well, maybe I should have come in a couple of years from now, or maybe I didn't need to come in today. No, no, no. I'm glad you came in today. And I want you to come in again next year at the same time, because I want to be able to track and see, I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody come in saying, well, how long do you think I've had this for? And unfortunately, my answer is, you know, I don't know. Because if we don't have anything to reference, then we have no idea how long it's gone on. Um, another thing I have found is that a lot of people, when they start having hearing issues, they go to the ear, nose, and throat doctors, which is good, but a lot of times they're not referred out to audiologists. And I think it needs to be expressed that, you know, if, if you have, you know, any ear issues that you really need, maybe see both, but you definitely need to get it checked. Well, and it's, we work very, we work hand in hand um, with primary care, with ear, nose, and throat, especially. We love our ear, nose, and throat. Um, physicians, but it's it's one of those things that we've got, what is the issue at hand that you're undergoing? With ear, nose, and throat physicians, you know, they're looking for infections, they're looking if there's any surgical issue going on that they need to treat, if there's any sinus causing a blockage, wax blockage. Um, and some ear, nose, and throat physician offices do have audiologists there that can help if they find that, okay, all of this is cleared, but we're still noticing there's an issue. Let's get a hearing evaluation going. Um, and, and some ear, nose, and throat physicians may not have an audiologist in their office as they primarily focus on, you know, more surgical or routes and things like that. But it's really important to look at, you know, when you're going to see um, 
anybody to do all the research to understand what could my issue, you know, what, what am I, what am I, what are my issues that I'm having? Um, ear, nose and throat will can medically inspect the ear. They can look and make sure that the ear is healthy. Um, and then once you get the all clear from an ear, nose and throat physician, it's like, okay, I got the all clear from the ear, nose and throat. Nothing looks abnormal, but I'm still noticing an issue when it comes to my hearing. Okay. Now I need to go get my hearing looked at. Um, and that's where, like I said, the referral to the audiologist would be the recommendation. I really appreciate everything you have said. And I think you've brought a lot of information to those of us out there that really had no idea what ototoxicity was. Is there anything else we may have missed or <laughs> forgotten? Well, we covered a lot, but I, I just one of the main points that I have to end is like, Ultimately, you know, there's research everywhere that's going to say all these different things, but I truly believe that we know in our bodies that it, when something's wrong or something could be going on. And, you know, what I love is we have to, we advocate for ourselves, you know, regardless of what could be going on. Um, and so if you're Ask the questions to your physicians when you when you go in. Ask the questions when you are being put on a treatment plan. Um, get the baselines that you believe you need to get done because if if we don't continue to advocate for ourselves, um, something can always be missed missed over on accident. And so, especially when it comes to the hearing and knowing the impact it can have on the brain. I just encourage anybody undergoing any type of treatment, or if you're not undergoing treatment and you're just, you're just thinking, you know, everything looks good. Maybe I'll just go get a test done. Yes, go get it done. You know, a lot of times, you know, insurance will pay for the preventative, preventative appointments. And so go and get it done. If you're curious about it, just go and do it. Um, because otherwise, you may regret not getting it done down the road. And so just uh, my biggest points are just advocate for yourself, um, ask questions, be involved with your treatment process so that you're fully aware and you understand, you know, the measures that are being taken to help you. Well, I wanna thank you again. Um, again, this was Dr. Ariel Richard. Um, and it has been very informative. And thank you, thank you so much for being part of this advocate chat. And I also would like to um, thank all of those who have listened. Um, come see us in Texas at the Alamo Breast Cancer Foundation Advocate Program in December. Again, this has been Alamo Breast Cancer Foundation Advocate Chat on ototoxicity, hearing and balance. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for having me. Take care, guys.